Hello, I'm John Linz, and in this video I will be discussing word vectors for natural language processing as well as the skipgram model to construct said word vectors. Now the reason why we create uh, word to vector models to create uh, these word vectors is because computers don't actually understand words. They can only understand numerical values. So the challenge is to convert these words into vectors or some sort of numerical representation so that not only computers understand them, but they understand how it's relevant to surrounding words. With that said, let's get into it. So first we have to discuss one-hot encoding. Now one-hot encoding is a way to represent words using one-hot encoding vectors. Um, now one-hot encoding vectors don't carry any uh, intrinsic um, meaning to the words. It simply tells the computer what each word is. It, it identifies unique words. Um, so in this example here, we have a corpus uh, with three words, apple, orange, and banana. And since there are three unique words in the corpus, each one hot encoding vector will have uh, three dimensions or three elements. And every element in the vector will have a value of zero, except for one. Uh, one value will have the value of one. And since each word is unique, each one hot encoding vector is also unique. Now, there is a huge problem with this. Um, and like I mentioned, it doesn't actually tell the computer uh, any sort of connection. It doesn't tell the computer that, hey, maybe Apple has a connection with orange because they're both fruits. Uh, it simply just tells the computer that these are two completely separate words. So here's an example um, using one hot encoding. We can represent these two sentences. So given this corpus, we can assign a one hot encoding vector to each word. So te teachers, it would be uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, teach is 0, 1, 0, 0, uh, and so on. And as you can see, in each one hot encoding vector, one element has the value of 1, while the rest have a value of 0, and they are all unique, since each word in the corpus is also unique. And this is how you would represent each word um, as a sentence. Uh, it would be in these given matrices. Now, uh, as you can see, you can rearrange these words. Uh, you can use the same word more than once. In that case, you use the same one hot encoding vector. So now let's discuss um, one hot encoding versus word to vec. And as I've mentioned, one hot encoding does not give each word uh, a, an intrinsic meaning. It simply tells the computer what each word is. It simply tells the computer that this is a unique word. It's different from all the other words in the corpus. Um, so. Um, if you use this, this method, then the artificial neural network uh, doesn't actually understand how it's relevant to other words. So for example, given the word cat and the word lion, uh, the artificial neural network sees these two words completely differently and doesn't understand that they actually have a similar meaning. But alternatively, you can con construct word vectors um, using skipgram or continuous bag of words, which I'll be discussing in just a moment, um, to place words with similar meaning or relevance uh, closer together in vector space. So how are these word vectors actually created or constructed? Well, there are a few ways to do it, um, two of which include the skipgram model, which I'll be focusing on in this video, as well as continuous bag words. And these models learn the meaning and relevance of each word based on its context and its surrounding word. Uh, so as an example, teachers and school might show up in the same context often, so it will begin to understand, oh, well, maybe there's some sort of relevance between these two words. So here is a brief overview of skipgram and continuous bag of words. One thing you might notice is that they are actually opposites of each other. Uh, well, the skipgram predicts surrounding words given one word, so it's input a center, it, you input a center word and it predicts surrounding words, while continuous bag of words inputs surrounding words and outputs a center word. Um, it's also important to note that continuous bag of words is faster, but skipgram does a better job at predicting infrequent words. So here's an exercise. Uh, given these words, um, I want you to find the probability that student occurs in the context of school or that dog occurs in the context of school, walk, or study. Um, and of course, this all has to add up to uh, 100%. Um, so I'll give you a moment to do that, um, but I will now give you the probabilities that I assigned to, uh, to these. Now, of course, this might be different depending on how you looked at this, 
Um, this is just an example of how a human might assign probabilities to these. Uh, so for students, I gave it uh, about 40% probability because uh, there's a common noun that relates to, to school. Uh, dog, I gave it about 3%. There isn't really much relevance, um, maybe unless it's in the context of, oh, I brought my dog to school or something like that. I gave walk about 14%. I thought, you know, maybe the only uh, like use case of the word walk in relevance to school might be like, oh, I walked to school or I walked around the school. Um, and then for study, I gave that a solid 43% uh, because study studying is um, a very common verb uh, that relates to school. So now I'd like to really focus in on the skipgram model, and I'll really be digging into the technicalities of how it works. So uh, given this corpus here, the skipgram model, what it does is it, it iteratively looks through each word within a certain window size. And the window size is actually a hyperparameter. It is set to three in this case. And what that means is that it analyzes three words in front of the center word and three words after the or behind the center word. Um, and the goal is to calculate the probability of each of these context words occurring given that center word. So for example, uh, if student is present in the, in the corpus, there should be a higher probability that school is in the same context word as opposed to dog, which has less relevance. Um, and here this is another just sort of overview of what the skipgram model does. You input student, um, it goes through a few layers, and it outputs the probabilities of certain words occurring. So let's now take a closer look. Now you take your one hot encoding vector of the center word, and you pass that into skipgram as an input. You then uh, multiply that by the lookup table. And since the one hot encoding vector is all zeros, uh, except for that one one in there, um, all the other words in the lookup table are basically, since it's mu multiplication by zero, um, they no longer exist, they just become zero. Uh, but since there's that one element, which is one, um, it will uh, essentially output the that one um, embedding vector, uh, which corresponds with that index, essentially. Now, um, what you then do is you transpose that vector into a projection layer, uh, which becomes your hidden layer. And um, you then compute this like it's a regular neural network. Uh, you have a second weight matrix and you get your outputs. Although these outputs are a little bit different, uh, in this case, we use the softmax activation function to create a probability distribution. Um, and then you calculate the error. Uh, we use cross entropy for this, and you do some uh, back propagation, and you essentially tweak these uh, these vectors, these weight vectors. And what's interesting is if you ever wondered, okay, well, how do you actually get the uh, vect word vector from this? Well, the word vector is actually going to be the weight. The weight vector becomes your word embedding. So I just thought that was really interesting. So once your model has been trained and the loss has been minimized, you now have your word embeddings. And if you want to find the probability of some predicted word occurring given a center word, computationally, what you can now do is take e to the power of the dot product of that given predicted word uh, with the center word and divide it by the sum of e to the power of the dot product of all the predicted words um, and the center word. So now to um, get even more of an intuition here, let's look at this numerical example. Um, as you can see, this is that one hot encoding vector, which we treat as an input. Um, and then this is our projection layer, which is our, also our hidden layer. And this is the uh, word embedding representation of students. And then this is our second weight matrix. and uh, these all have our own context word vectors, which are tweaked over time to become the um, embedding vectors of each of these uh, words within that window. And since we're using softmax, we're going to get a probability distribution. So I don't know if you've noticed, but in each of these vectors, um, these all add up to, each element here will add up to one or 100%. 
And um, you might notice that in the, the largest probability, um, you could think of that as the one, right? You might think of a, um, you know, skip gram as you input a one-hot encoding vector and you output a one-hot encoding vector. Now, you're not actually outputting a, you know, like a valid one-hot encoding vector. It's, it's actually this probability distribution, and the largest probability corresponds to one. So now when you actually calculate the error here, um, you're essentially checking, like, okay, well, did it correspond to the right, um, to the right one hot encoding vector? Because we know that this is the one hot encoding vector for the word teacher. So is this true? Well, yes, it is, uh, because the highest probability is in that same um, index. Uh, and in this case, it is not true. Uh, and in these two cases, it is true. And um, what we then do is we analyze this and we um, compute uh, our gradients and we conduct ba uh, back propagation using the cross entropy loss function. So now that you actually have your word vectors, you can think of these word vectors as just regular vectors, um, except now uh, you might notice that words with similar meaning are closer together in vector space. And you can do a lot of interesting stuff with that. For example, you could compute the relevance of two words by taking either the Euclidean distance or the cosine distance. Um, and I actually wrote a little Python script um, which sort of uh, implements that. So this is that Python script. As you can see, this is our corpus. Uh, we use the Jensen model and we, we import the word to vec uh, package and we essentially construct word vectors from from this corpus we can then retrieve their word vectors um, and as you can see I'm storing these word vectors in these three variables and right here um, I'm essentially just computing the Euclidean distance um, so if you uh, this is the output and um, you might have noticed that I'm comparing uh, this target word to um, this variable uh, which is the word vec for student so um, as you can see, a student it, it has closer relevance to the, or is, is closer in vector space to the word learn, which makes sense because it, is more, it has more relevance uh, to the word learn than teachers do, although it's still relatively close. So I've implemented the same Python script, but using the fast text model. Um, and what's interesting about the fast text model is it has the ability to quickly construct uh, vector representations of words for unique words, words that um, were unlikely to occur in the training corpus. And this is very useful if you're trying to um, manipulate a corpus of words uh, that have a high probability of containing um, various words that aren't really commonly used. And there is a chance that um, even though it was trained on you know thousands of articles on the internet, uh, chances are it never came across that word. Uh, so that's where fast text really shines um, if you have unique words uh, that you don't think are likely to occur in the training corpus. And this is how I implemented that. It essentially does the exact same thing, although I'm comparing different words here. Um, as you can see, lion is much closer in vector space to the word stripe than the word dog is. And this makes sense because lions have stripes. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if the word lion and the word stripe occurred often together in the training corpus. So what are the applications of these word vectors? Uh, well, I'm sure you knew this going into the video, but uh, if you don't, then it's used for pretty much every natural language processing task, including sentiment analysis, summarization, rephrasing, and text generation. Okay, so that is all I have for you. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye.